And that's because I'm going to become a dad in 2023. Being able to say on this episode, I can bench 225 pounds. I've always, always, always wanted to be able to say that. I smashed through my financial goals for 2022. I have no problem sharing my revenue numbers. It was over 100. Like I'm finally putting it out there that like my mom had cancer for a really long time. She wasn't really getting treatment for it. And she died 10 days ago. I just need to kind of like make this to get this off of my chest. What is up, folks? I am admittedly a bit of a weirdo. I do this thing every year. It's probably been five years now of doing this where I write something called a playbook, and it's effectively what I plan to do for that calendar year. I don't do New Year's resolutions. I don't do the things where I do like a yearly review. I think a lot of other content creators do that sort of thing. I almost look at it towards this is what I planned to do. This is my thinking behind why I decided to do it. And I will do some recalls to kind of like this is the habits. These are the pieces of content. These are the tips and tactics. Those are towards the end of this episode that I really enjoyed from the past year and that I've kind of brought into my life intentionally. And I think there's something about uh, there's this mental model or just quality of people that I've just been increasingly attracted to over the past couple of years, which is the like, call your shot and then just go for it. Or it's almost like say what you want and then get after it. And I think there's something to like, we have so many options. There are just so many routes and choices that you can make and decisions that you can navigate in your life. And I think for the people that I respect a lot, the people that I really kind of want to be around or that I get a lot of inspiration from, it's the people who decide that they want really want to do something and they really kind of like intentionally think about it or they look at the options on the board and they're like, I don't really, I don't really like that thing. Or I, I, I think that society says that you should do this, but I think that there's something else here. I really respect that. That's the type of person that I want to be. And so as I've kind of, that did, that's not how these playbooks started. These playbooks started because I was like a little bit lost and I really needed a little bit of like help. And I, I wasn't getting so much help from mentors anymore. And I really just needed to step into that active role of like authoring my life a little bit. And so it certainly helped me. If you want to do something similar, I'd invite you to do something th uh, the same. And I post it on my, on my website. It is uh, more or less this kind of segmentation that I'm starting to notice, which is like the difference between the Justin Kana as a person, as a brand, as a, as a creator, and then all of my chef related things, which is like what I always wanted repertoire to be. And so this is kind of the first one where I don't think I'm going to actually upload this on the repertoire podcast. I'm going to upload it as an episode so that you can put, I can put it on my website and then you can listen to it just audio only if that's your jam, but it's kind of only going to live on this YouTube channel. And then obviously the blog post that goes on my website. And it's a big shift because it's like, I, I have been building and, and, and creating and trying to build up this platform in a way that has been always just self-satisfactory. It's always been like the scratch your own itch kind of way to, to navigate things. But as I have brought people on and as I have delegated things and as I have had other ideas that have kind of like, I would, I think it would be really cool to do that. It's been really difficult to do that under Justin as the name. And when, again, I look at the people that I really respect, the people that I want to emulate, the people that I've learned a ton from, they've done a really good job of having the thing that is bigger than them, that they can hire a team to run, that in a lot of really practical ways becomes almost like uh, professional satisfaction, it's cash flowing, it can scale, and then they keep the thing that is uniquely them, something that they can run, that they can contribute to, that they can get their ideas out there into the world. So I thought this would kind of be like a life update. This I've done life update videos in the past, but I think that there's also been this kind of like itching sensation that I've had where I'm not sharing enough. I think that there's also been this funny paradox almost where like I read the don't become famous thing by Tim Ferriss. I think that I've also seen other content creators who have gotten into a lot of hot water from sharing too much of their lives online. And I think I've gotten to this funny place where I don't want to share things for either fear of negative comments coming through for fear of maybe I'm being a little bit too vulnerable. Maybe I'm putting myself out there a little bit too much. And I think it's gotten to a place where it's ultimately hurting me because I don't want to share because you folks don't have the context of some of the stuff I'm going to share in this video. And so I wanted to make this almost as a like big catch up. I don't expect every single subscriber, or viewer, or follower to watch this. I just need to kind of like make this to get this off of my chest and make sure that I feel good about like, okay, well, at least I've given you folks an update on this stuff. 
because I think there is a, a balance. There's a way to thread the needle on this where you're not oversharing, where people are like personally attacking you or you're subjecting your family members to these funny, weird, awkward situations just for the content. But then also you're not like this hermit where nobody knows nothing and nobody knows anything about you. And you have no way to kind of like connect on a human level with the people that are following your stuff. Because I, I always come back. It's not like I always. I, I really try to come back to my own user behavior of I really get a lot of value when I know that Tim Ferriss struggled with sexual abuse as a kid. And that's why he navigated going into uh, psychedelic therapy. I really like hearing that Gary V has such a close relationship with his mom and dad, and he went through those strifes of building up that family business in that way, and he is now opening up a lot about it a little bit more, but like, I get value from that stuff because I get to see like, oh, there's this aspect of this person that I resonate with that, oh, that makes sense why they're like that. And I don't expect anybody to like completely understand my psych psychoanalytical behavior or anything like that. But I think I, I'm trying to admit that I swung a little bit too far in the other direction where I wasn't sharing anything. And I thought I was protecting something. I thought I was being responsible. I thought I was setting myself for uh, up for not getting hurt. And ultimately, like, I had to come to terms with the fact that, like, I wasn't sharing enough. And it was preventing me from publishing, preventing me from being authentic, preventing me from ultimately probably helping people more, which is a uh, core value of mine. I've shared that in previous other playbooks. But without further ado, I want to get into this 2023 playbook. If you're not familiar with how these work, it's almost like if I were to have written an audiobook uh, or uh, a book and I'm recording the audiobook now. So I'm going to read a lot of it, but I'm also going to interject with additional context, additional stories. And this is long enough of an intro. The first piece is the fact that this is a tardy publication. So usually this would come out in January. I started writing this in January. It is currently almost July when this is going to come out. And part of that is due to a lot of that sharing problem that I just shared. Part of it is due to some exciting news that I'm going to share in the family section that I didn't want to announce until I felt comfortable. You can obviously check out any previous editions through the link that's down low in the description. But welcome to my annual account of lessons learned, hacks, favorites, and plans for the year ahead. The idea being that you should be able to backtrack through previous playbooks and identify a sense of what I did to accomplish what I achieved, see what I missed, see what I omitted entirely, where it's like, I've heard a bunch of people talking about this, but like, is Justin actually doing this? And I'm not like the end all be all, but I've certainly gotten a lot of value from like, cherry picking individual pieces of advice or tactics from, you know, just other people that put out stuff on the internet. And so inside each of these, I focus on what I plan to do instead of what I plan on achieving. So I actually don't really talk about like, oh, well, I'm going to become, you know, cover of this magazine. I'm going to reach, you know, X number on the charts on the podcast or something like that. I talk about the what I'm going to do. So that's also hopefully a little bit of a helpful reframe, especially if you're the type of person who is like struggling to have goals. And so for those that are new, this breaks down into the very like Benjamin Franklin health, wealth, uh, work, and family. Those are the kind of four big headers. And then I go through a bunch of the miscellaneous stuff at the end. So please enjoy. Let's start with health. So in 2022, in that playbook, I proclaimed that I was in the best shape of my life. And that trend happily continues into 2023. So I'm going to start with strength training. I have personally never felt more capable when it comes to strength training. And that's been due to a few changes that I made in 2022. And the first change for me was environmental. So when we moved into this house last year, I didn't have access, convenient access to a gym with barbells. And considering I wanted to keep that strength training habit I enrolled in something in the U.S. called a Planet Fitness, which is like a chain of gyms. They are very explicit with the fact that they don't have any barbells, and it's mostly machines in there. And I told myself, you know, like, Justin, you have enough of the basics down. You know how to lift. You know how to oh, – your technique is good. And I actually achieved, like, some pretty good strength standards for my body weight. I put on, you know, quite a bit of muscle. 
And I convinced myself that I can continue to maintain that strength at this Planet Fitness. And for me, that was an inc- that was incredibly wrong. I couldn't have been more wrong. So after four months-ish in that gym, the rust started to develop and my progress started to deteriorate on my compound list. So I couldn't bench as much, I couldn't squat as much, and I could not deadlift as much. And that really sucked because it felt like going backwards progress-wise. And so to make that change, I there's a new gym that's opened. It's nearby our house. It has everything that I need, barbells included. There's actually a additional like CrossFit section of the gym called the Champions Room, but it costs extra and it includes classes that I don't really need. And so I actually don't pay for that. And so I included that in the playbook mostly to just give people a heads up that like just because an option is available and there's like a super mega ultra premium tier of something, only go with that if you think that that what's included in that is missing. And I think that there's, you know, certain areas of my life where like I do pay for that, where I do want to go the extra mile because I think that it's worth it. But really evaluating that ultimately helps you budget more, you know, effectively. It ultimately helps you be more bought in and motivated to the thing that you decided to do. And so that's why I brought it up. Even though I can't walk to this new gym, I have also included sunk cost into this decision by paying for a full year's membership. And then I work time into my day to ensure that I can get high quality training in every week. I either take the train or I drive there. The next change that I made is in relation to the style of training. And this is mostly changed in the six months since I started to write this. And so, again, benefits of me being able to come back and do kind of like a little bit of a reversion or review of this. And the style has changed from full body that I was doing towards the tail end of 2022 to a going back to like a push pull legs split. Some people call that a bro split. Some people say that's not a bro split. Push pull legs is you do an entire day of pushing exercises. Then the next day you do all pulling exercises. Then you do leg exercises for those that don't know. And I told myself in when I wrote this, this is actually good that I wrote this, the first half of 2023, that's what I was going to do. So to avoid having one workout program for every single day of those three days, I've stolen an idea from Jeff Nippard, who is a content creator, fitness person, where I've basically created two programs per split. So I've taken all my favorite push exercises and I've divvied them amongst two days. And so I have six separate routines, two for each of the three splits. And so instead of having to cram every single one of my push exercises into one all-encompassing day, I divvy them up, which keeps each session focused, and it adds a really engaging amount of variety. Also, one tweak that I've done is to acknowledge the amount of posterior chain contribution to the deadlift. And so I actually deadlift on my pull days, which I find pretty contrary to a certain number of fitness influencers out there. A lot of fitness influencers will say deadlifting is for your leg day. I actually get pretty bored with pull-ups as well. And so bicep uh, with pull-ups and bicep curls and rows on pull days, it's like there's only so many variations of those that I can do before I get bored. And so having deadlifting as part of one of those pull days really gives me something to look forward to because I love deadlifting. I would also argue that keeping leg days exclusively squat focused has been one of the reasons that I've seen such a big boost in progress of that lift over the past, you know, I'll call it like 10 months. Another hack or just piece of information from uh, Dr. Andrew Humerbin is to do your leg day first when you start this type of programming for a couple of reasons. One, legs typically require the longest recovery period. So you'll do, like I squatted yesterday. It's like, I'm going to be sore. I was sore yesterday coming off the workout. I'm going to be sore today. And I'm probably also going to be sore tomorrow. I don't find that that happens when I do like heavy rows or bench press, right? It's like a day and a half recovery period. And if we're being honest, it's almost like the most dreaded day too. And so consider leg day as like eating the frog. If you've ever heard that mental model of like, do the thing that you dread doing the most first, and then that sets you up for everything else to almost be quote unquote easy. And then you can get out of the way early, right? So that specific change alone, switching from full body to push pull legs has resulted in me hitting a new squat PR this year, 315 pounds. I hit that earlier in the January, February timeframe when I was writing this originally, I actually lifted 315 again yesterday. And so I've been able to maintain it. And my leg muscle definition is the result that I'm the most happy with. So I have had to buy all new pants. I have thick thighs now. And it's definitely, I grew up with weak legs. So I had poor development in my quads and in my hamstrings. And so to actually have like strong legs now is just a really good feeling. 
my bench press still needs work, and I'm planning on making that my key focus for at least the second half of this year. I, if I can manage to hit a 275-pound bench, that puts me in the 1,000-pound club for lifting. So I will have a 415-pound deadlift, which I still have, 315-pound squat, which I still have. I did it yesterday. And a 275-pound bench press puts me over that threshold. I don't necessarily know if that's how it's going to play out and if I might up the deadlift a little bit and up the squat a little bit and then keep the bench press somewhere around 250. But that feels like a good place to like maintain. It's like a clean mental number. I will be able to tell my kids someday that those are my deadlifting or, you know, my lifting numbers. And I just fear that at my current body weight, unless I'm going to like crazy bulk up or hire a trainer or like get my form more locked in, going above that is like an injury waiting to happen, right? You don't hear about people injuring themselves squatting 315. You hear about them injuring themselves when they're trying to squat 475. And I'm just not interested in that trade-off. And so I feel like I have a good physique developing. I like feeling as strong as I am right now. And so to continue to maintain those numbers, instead of going for these big PRs, I'm going to use a one rep max calculator to reverse engineer what I need to be lifting in order to ensure that I can lower the weight on the bar, but then use higher volumes to make up that difference. So what's an example? I hit... This was probably like six weeks ago, two months ago. I hit 13 reps on a 315 pound deadlift. And if you plug that into the one rep max calculator, that's a 451 pound one rep max. I was definitely sore the next day. I'm not going to say that that was easy, but I didn't feel remotely close to injuring myself when I was doing those 13 reps, 315 pounds in the bar. It's not a perfect system, and I also don't go around touting that I have I have a 450-pound deadlift, right? I don't say that to anybody, but it allows me to be able to remain at some above-average numbers without winding up in physical therapy. That's the goal, is to avoid that at all costs. And one last benefit I've seen from the push-pill leg split is the decrease in the overall workout time. Things just go faster. When you're hammering your legs or you're hammering your back or you're really just focusing on chest— it's difficult to go for more than 40 minutes if you're really like your sets and reps and weights are really dialed in. And my full body training, which I've switched back to now, that's what I'm currently doing now. It's nice because I can work out like two, three times a week versus four to five times a week. And I can maintain. That's kind of what I'm doing right now. But I feel like I was when I was not progressively overloading and on full body. I felt like I was just going through the motions and I could stay, spend an hour, 80 minutes in the gym. And so I'm getting this like 50% time savings combined with better results. It's like, it's, it's a bit of a no brainer for this type of a training session. And so what I've kind of landed on, my deadlift's in a good spot, my squat's in a good spot. I'm going to be shifting to a chest focused full body split once I hit a 225 pound bench, which I actually achieved in June of 2023. This month, it was like two or three weeks ago, I hit 225 on bench for the first time. Probably have the video on screen right now if you want to watch it. And that has basically really kind of like cemented my progress and the big push that I've been, you know, just kind of really working towards over the past couple months and years. And so think of it like I will do full body stuff as the training split. That's how I've reformatted all my programming. I have four different full body program days, but I, at the start of the workout, I do incline bench, I do barbell bench press, I do overhead pressing. And so that makes it so that when I'm at my freshest, I'm doing my chest focus stuff. And then that makes sure that, that because that's my weakest body part, I will be able to continue to make gains there. And then everything else is just like the mental clarity, the just like physical fitness, you know, health benefits that I get from strength training. And I don't have to do it as much. And I'll talk a little bit about the other, you know, workout stuff that I've been incorporating there. And so forgive me if this is not the content that you normally kind of like subscribe to me for, but like this is my one time a year when I get to talk about strength training and lifting something that I put a lot of time and energy and thought into. And I've seen a lot of progress and it's been, you know, like at least 40 pounds of muscle gained. I went from 160 pounds to 200 pounds. And so, you know, obviously that's not all 100% muscle. I've, you know, bulked up in, you know, other ways. But I think that there's been a lot of, you know, satisfaction in just showing that the just focused progressive overload works. And that's why I think I bring so many of those principles into my teaching stuff when I'm talking to you folks or when I put out a piece of content or even like that's why I made the rep series because it's like I've gotten so much value from strength training principles 
in skill development. And so that's why that's why I talk about it. That's why I like it. And if you're also a little bit of a gym rat or a bro, you can let me know in the comments. All right, next point on health is cardiovascular health. And I will be honest, my health, my heart still worries me. So I had another cardiovascular episode in my family happen this year. It continues to be a concern that I'm planning on addressing in an upcoming visit with my doctor. For this case, that visit has already happened, and I'm kind of like on the high end of my cholesterol numbers, but I, I'll share it in a little bit. I'm not actually planning on making that many changes. Um, the things that diet wise, the things that I do plan on making changes are are in relation to doing less time in the gym and doing more time doing sprints and zone two cardio. So let's start with sprints. So I do a seven minute rowing sprint at least once a week as part of my corrective day. So I get on a rowing machine and I do the Hugh Jackman try to get uh, 2000 meters done in seven minutes. And I want to incorporate one more sprinting session in either outside when the weather is nice or in the gym at on a treadmill. And what I really like about the rowing machine is it shows you what your pace is. And a treadmill allows you to do the same thing. So if I have the number set on the screen and I maybe put a little bit of an incline in there, I know that I'm hitting those metrics every single time. Whereas anybody who's ever sprinted outside, you know this feeling of like, well, you're sprinting, you feel like you're going really, really hard, but it's like, how fast are you actually going? If you're on a track or something like that, it's easy if you're timing yourself. I used to do that. I really liked doing that. But the whole goal here is to basically push my heart to go harder, make my heart stronger, make my lungs stronger, and to a lot of Peter Atia's advice, especially in his newest book, increase my VO2 max. And so that's the big goal there. Secondly, zone two cardio, unless you've been living under a rock, this methodology kind of took the world by storm in 2022 and 2021. I haven't done the specific work to identify my zones. My aura ring that I wear allows for workout heart rate tracking. And so I plan on using a route that's in my neighborhood um, to shoot for three to four 60 minute walks per week. And I will do that over time to monitor changes, mostly looking to see if I can see an increase in HRV and sleep quality. And based on the past six months of me doing that, thumbs up, it's like sun exposure. It is a little bit of cardiovascular stuff. It's like, it's a nice kind of like movement and blood flow thing for my legs, especially after heavy squatting leg days. I also just really enjoy the lack of fatigue that comes from having good cardio on little moments. Like you climb a set of stairs, right? And if you're walking next to somebody and like you climb three sets of stairs and they're just like winded and you get to the top of those three sets of stairs and you're not winded, it's like a really good feeling like and I don't rub it in their face or anything but it's like oh I see relationally relatively where my fitness level is compared to the average person and so it's like selfishly that's like just a good feeling once I adapt to where I'm kind of at with this hill route and I'm kind of getting there now I'm my heart rate isn't going up as as far I'm not getting as winded I'm can still breathe through my nose on these hill routes that I take I'm gonna get a uh, rucksack which is somewhere between 10 and 20% of your body weight. You put that in there and then you go on those same walks or I might start running. I haven't quite decided if I want to start running with the weather being so nice right now in Seattle as it is. I, I, I kind of want to. And especially with like if I can maintain zone two somewhere in there with running and if I can, you know, get back into uh, an audiobook slash podcast, you know, like binge habit, I usually do that normally with just like out or on the house chores if I can get something like that, I think that that will be really, really beneficial, but I haven't quite decided. I also want to lean out a little bit. And so, yeah, just all things that I'm thinking about. If I was significantly overweight and my heart issues, my cholesterol panel was still coming back the way that it is, I think I would change my diet a little bit more, but I'm more thinking about changing how I burn fuel versus changing the type of fuel that I'm consuming. And it's not to say that I'm really going to just like continue to eat cheeseburgers and drink beer every day because that's not what I do already. It's just more, I need more physical activity and I need to actually just decrease the amount of calories that I'm eating. I don't want to change what I'm eating if all of this makes sense. And my doctor told me that like I'm relatively healthy. It's not really something that I need to worry about changing. And so as I get older, I'm just going to continue to monitor it. I wish that there was like more like fix problem here with solution here, but there really isn't a relation that I can exactly draw. I will have these like weird fluttery heart movements that happen sometimes. My HRV is horrible. It's like 18. And so if I can identify, maybe there's like decreased stress, 
you know what I mean? Like there, there are different things that I, I'm trying to pull out as many stops as I can. And I'm just going to try to slowly monitor and make sure that I'm being on top of it and that I'm keeping it in the back burner of my mind. Anyways, let's talk about mobility. So for me, this has been the hardest health-related habit to maintain. I have written about mobility for the past three editions of this playbook, believe it or not, and virtually no progress has been made. This is mostly in relation to me, my ability to touch my toes. It, for me, just lacks numerical value. Like, if I'm talking about bench pressing, I can go from 135 to 155 to 185. I can see that on the bar. I can calculate that. But for touching my toes, it's like... Where's the number? Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's just this, it's like asymptotic. Like it's just getting closer and closer and closer, but it's maybe never going to get there. And that's how I feel. Like it's, it's, I lose motivation incredibly quickly. And so I just get bored with stretching and progressing towards flexibility goals. I also just don't have a deeper why as to being able to touch my toes. Like for me, being able to say on this episode, I can bench 225 pounds. I've always, always, always wanted to be able to say that. And it's like being able to touch my toes doesn't have the same, you know, ness to it. And also, my ability to not touch my toes doesn't really have an impact on my day to day life. It doesn't make me look better in the mirror. It doesn't hold me back from achieving any of my other fitness goals. So, like, I'm trying to just ask why. Why has this been so hard for me to maintain? However, remember when I said I have thick thighs now? That gives me a motivation to, like, round out this body part that I've taken so much time to develop, which is my legs. And so it's like, if you can squat all this stuff and your calves are looking good and all of this great benefits, like your ankle mobility is great. Why can't you touch your toes? Like I'm trying to use a little bit of that negative reinforcement to kind of like motivate myself. And, and so I'm going to give you an example of what a typical workout week might look like for me. I'm going to slightly tweak my training schedule, reintroduce that nighttime habit of stretching. So this is what it's going to look like. Sunday, I might do leg day. Monday, I will do a push day and I will do sprints either on the treadmill or outside. Tuesday, I will do yoga or I will play tennis and I will do a 60 minute walk that day, probably in the afternoon. Wednesday will be pull day back in the gym, 60 minute walk. Thursday will be yoga slash tennis and then I will do a 60 minute walk that day. Friday, I will also do a 60 minute walk and that will be push day. And then Saturday, it will be a corrective day. And then in there, I will do my rowing sprint somewhere in there. So I'm having sprinting happen twice a week. I have walking happening four to five times a week. And I'm having a leg and I have one, two, three, four days in the gym. I think that uh, five days in the gym that might shift slightly to be three days in the gym now that I'm on more of a full body split. But that just gives you kind of a sense of the fact that my yoga practice is coming back. I did yoga two days ago, and then that I, I significantly feel like contributed to me feeling so good squatting 315 yesterday. And it ensures that I get to basically work out every day, which also feels really, really good. And so if something in my schedule happens to disrupt one of those days, I can't make it to the gym. Doing the walk helps me at least tick the box that like you got outside and you got movement, or it makes it so that if I look at my schedule and I'm like, all right, something's got to move, something's got to shift or adjust here. Doing a yoga day at home saves me the commute back and forth to gym. So that is most likely the first one that's going to go. And then next, because I'm in maintenance mode with a lot of my strength training stuff now, I can almost have like passive, people talk about like passive income. It's like passive body. Alex Hormozzi talks about this, where I don't want to be getting bigger. I'm not going to feel like I'm like leaving something on the table if I don't make it to the gym. And so it's like, if I have to skip a day, I skip a day. And that ultimately mentally helps me be in a much better place with these habits. Last, last, let's talk about tennis. This functions as an excellent source of cardio for me. I have a great partner to play with considering he texts me when he has availability to play. And I've also joined these other like socially motivated tennis groups. We have one at a local tennis center here where I just get people texting me, emailing me, asking to schedule matches and our scores to get documented and contribute towards our ranking very incredibly motivating. If you can ever introduce stakes to something that you're trying to build, something that you want to stick with, it is so, so, so helpful to not having all of the onus just be on yourself with something that you're trying to do. And I just look forward to those types of workouts because like I want to win. So it's like a way to push yourself in a way that is not like, oh, just get a few more reps in or just like push a little bit more weight or any of these things. I'm like, it helps me bring out my competitive side. I should also include 
the fact that I am doing Jefferson curls into both one leg day and my corrective day, which ensures that I'm strengthening while increasing my range of motion as we're talking about mobility. And the two will ideally play off one of it, one another to improve my hamstrings. So range of motion is getting increased and I'm lifting in that extended range of motion. So I'm hoping that helps. And as I teased, I'm doing the nighttime stretching routine again. I've been a little bit too stimulated at nighttime, mostly social media and video games on my phone. And while it hasn't caused any issues to my sleep quality, it gets in the way of this like sleep hygiene that I have. And so the goal is to throw on my blue light blocking glasses. I get those from raw optics. I throw those on at 9 p.m. I stretch for about 10 to 15 minutes. I do a declutter of the house. I brush my teeth and... The big hack that I've discovered there is as I'm brushing my teeth, I walk over to my yoga mat and I roll it out on the floor as I'm brushing my teeth. And that way, when I'm done brushing my teeth, I put it down. And as I come out of the bathroom, I see my yoga mat there and I'm like, oh, I'm either going to have to roll that back up again in the morning like a dunce and I didn't stretch or I could just stretch right now. It's already unrolled. I will get that habit done and then I can roll it up and go to bed. And so it's basically just on me now to make sure that I continue to stick with that. I know exactly what to do. There's some great programming from um, Tom Merrick, I think, that I've shared in previous playbooks. If anybody wants to know what type of stretching routines that I do, that tends to help me a lot. And so let's talk about a couple of quick, as we round out the health section here, these are some like nice to haves. These are optimizations, little tweaks that I'm doing that I hope to see results from by the end of the year. If I don't, I don't. If I do, amazing. But I'm not making these key priorities. I'm also not ignoring them. So these might be experiments that I'm running or just little tweaks that I am thinking about. So the first one is visible abs. I know I said that I'm not overweight, but I wouldn't mind losing like 5 to 10 pounds this year. I realize a large contributor to my arm size and my leg size that I've been able to progress in was a calorie surplus. And so that's part of it where I was like, I was, I, I guess I would identify as like a hard gainer for a while where it was really hard for me to put on weight and build muscle. But now I'm like, I'm craving a six pack a little bit. And so for me, it's not a huge deal breaker. If it doesn't happen, it's not like you can't see abs on me, but like, I really want to like decrease the body fat percentage this year. And I'm just reasonably confident that I can do it. I have a higher muscle mass now. It's allowing me to just like burn more calories at baseline. If I continue to do the walking and I, if I just can continue to like maybe not add a dessert, like I don't have to have three desserts at the table when I go out to eat with friends, right? I don't have to have a drink or I don't have to have a beer, right? And so it's like these, I, I think about it as these like 100 to 300 calorie savings. Like that's all you really need to be in a calorie deficit is like 300 calories a day. And so I'm really starting to actively try to think about like those moments in the day where I am consuming 300 calories of something when I don't have to be, when it's like, it's not actually contributing to like genuine increase of enjoyment or I, it, it's not like withholding something for myself. And so the way I look at it is the size that I've put on from the recent bulk means that I'm on the edge of needing to change out a lot of my wardrobe if I continue to kind of like stay at the size. Like I already talked about needing to buy new pants. I'm getting to the place where like my shirts aren't fitting in the same way that they were anymore. Like my shoulder mark on my t-shirts aren't, isn't in the same place on my shoulder as it was before. It's like inching up towards my neck. And so that's a bit of a weird feeling. I realize this is kind of like definitely bro stuff to be talking about, but you know, it's just, again, this is my one time of year when I get to do this. All right, another help, health optimization is grip strength. So after having some elderly family members suffer from falls this year, I'm seeing the benefit to having good grip strength in day-to-day -day life. And my lifts benefit a lot from it too. If you can grip the bar more strongly and you can have the weight on that bar go up, your deadlift is going to be higher. Same thing with your pull-ups, right? Like if, if your hands are the first thing to give out on a pull-up, it's like you could have developed your lats more, but it's like your grip strength is is weak. And so I'm incorporating hanging into my leg day, into my corrective day. And the goal is to hit two consecutive minutes of a dead hang. And I do wear gloves because I have these kind of like lifting calluses on my fingers and my hands also sweat a lot. And so that 
makes it really painful and difficult to hang. It's not that my, gr my grip strength is actually weak. It's that I have these other, you know, additional factors and challenges that I have to worry about. And so those workout gloves that I shared a couple of years ago, they're also linked in the playbook here, has been a huge help for me. Next health optimization is meditation. I feel like I have come full circle on meditation over the past five years. So from experimenting with different apps and methods, I call that the confused stage. So I would use Calm, I used Headspace, and I ultimately found Waking Up by Sam Harris. That was really, really helpful. Then I was dogmatically committed to the habit. And I was like, I am not a sane person if I don't meditate every single day. So I was like dependent on it. That was the dependent stage of me for me with meditation. Then I foregoed the, I just stopped doing the habit altogether. That was the, I don't need this phase of my meditation relationship. And now I'm confidently in a productive relationship with meditation. And so for me, the sweet spot is 20 minutes. Sometimes it's just 10 minutes. I still use the waking up app every single day in the morning after I make my coffee. Sometimes I sit outside. Sometimes I sit on the floor. Sometimes I just sit on our couch. And it's incredibly similar to the stretching habit that I have in that I don't see it manifest in any specific moment in my life. It's not like I have something happen and it's like, oh, I'm so glad I, I meditated for just for this moment. It's knowing that repeatedly doing it gives me massive benefit in the long term in, in unseen ways. That's why I do it. And I'm less reactive. I'm less prone to anxiety. I'm more present. All of these benefits I feel. A couple of thoughts on meditation that you know, I've had, again, I've, I've really internalized in this full circle cycle that I've gone through with the habit. The first one is you are not your thoughts. And this is a weird thing to say for someone who doesn't meditate, but it's, it's almost like you have to, you, you come to this realization after a significant amount of time spent practicing. And so your thoughts just simply arise in your consciousness and this has profound implications in self-identification with what happens to you. So that's a huge benefit that I've noticed. Second one is value in the present. And what I've really grappled with and learned and I think internalized is this fact that most of what people claim to want is just increased levels of presence in their own life. So people will seek out these peak experiences whether it's through substance-induced states or having an escape, quote-unquote, just so that they can feel more fully absorbed in what's happening to them. And I personally get that experience every morning. It's not always every morning that it's super blissed out, but it's like I really lock in and I just become more present every single morning. And so it's almost like I, I, I it's exposure therapy, right? So it's like I'm getting to taste what being present feels like more often so that I can settle into that state in other moments of my life more often than I would otherwise. The last benefit that I've seen is related to labeling. And so anytime that I find myself labeling thoughts or feelings as bad, I find that to not be useful. This has been touched on by multiple folks. I'm going to just give credit to a couple of people that have shared this in different ways, but like I see it in my meditation the most. The way that Sam Harris guides me through the meditation app and he talks about thoughts and feelings and their usefulness in your day-to-day -day life. That's obviously the, the first one, but I've heard this been talked about by Derek Sivers before, where he talks about the fact that he doesn't speak about the weather as being good or bad when he talks to his kids. Why is rain bad? It's just rain. Like there's fun ways to spend a rainy day. A lot of people talk about how nice and cozy they feel when it rains outside because they can like be inside and make a chai and sit next to the fire. Like just because you label something as bad ultimately has all these cascading downward effects to how it affects your mood, how it affects how you treat people, how you make decisions. All of that's really important. And then another person who's brought this up is Alex Hermosi, where he has this tweet where he says, quote, I tire of people labeling human emotions as problems. The implied solution becomes don't feel these or feel these rather than those, which is silly. When the negative label is the problem, not the emotion itself. You can be sad. You can be angry. You can be stressed. It comes with being human. And so a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the reasons that we get so wound up on these states of being is because we've labeled them as bad, not because they're happening to us. When I had that thought, I was like, okay, 
totally makes sense, at least for me. And so with that, that ends the health section. We're going to move on to work next, which I think is the longest part of this. And so if you're still with me, thanks for thanks for listening and listening to, to my, my life update here. So the first dot point on work is compounding is difficult to comprehend. There's a reason Einstein called it the eighth wonder of the world. I've been publishing on the internet for almost six years now. This is like the first year when I really felt like it was financially wor worth it and like professionally worth it. And that might sound weird to say because I've helped a lot of people and I've grown the channel to at least bigger than I thought it would ever probably get. And the immense satisfaction that I get from making work that I'm proud of and the benefits of helping you folks has always been there. That's that, that's that's always had a, a specific draw from me to, to, to continuing to do this. But I've always felt frustrated with how much money I made in all of this. And the big change that I made and the reason that I wanted to talk about this is that I stopped pursuing more information this year. I actually didn't read that many like business books for my own business. Instead, I returned to what I knew worked and I stopped trying to be clever. And this quote comes to mind, which is like, we need to be reminded more than we need to be need to be taught. And I think about that a lot, especially recently with like, you know how to do this. You know what you should be doing. You know what what the problem is and how to fix it. Don't informationally masturbate. Just go fix the problem. And I think in the early years of my going out on my own, making it for myself kind of journey, it's like I didn't know what the solution was. I was just like, oh, I'm stuck on this. And more information really had marginal returns for me. But now, or at least in the past 12 months, I could find myself like there would be a problem. I would know what to do to fix it. Or I knew that I was putting something off or not addressing something. And I would just find myself like pulling a book off the shelf or listening to a podcast or watching a founder interview on YouTube. It was like, you're wasting time. Like, you know exactly what you need to be doing. And so what came to fruition this year was the result of the next few bullet points. And if I'm being honest, I absolutely felt the quote from the graph that I put in the article, which is the Jack Butcher quote uh, thing where it's a it's a compounding graph. And there's just a bunch of little ticks on the graph where the, the graph isn't moving at all right before it hockey sticks and three ticks right before it starts to hockey stick. There's a arrow that points up and it says this is pointless. So a lot of times when you're like you're in those beginning stages where you're laying the foundation it feels pointless. Like it really is like, why am I making this? Why am I doing this? What value is this bringing? Because in a lot of times it is negative producing, like you're losing money, you're losing time. You're, you know, like not taking full advantage of the things that are available to you, but it does end up being worth it. I'm not at the top of the hockey stick by any means, but I think that I am kind of out of the, this is pointless stage of this trek. And so I just wanted to share that if you're in those stages where it does feel pointless, obviously don't continue to do something that is not working, but it's also something where you need to acknowledge that like good things take time. And so let's talk about the work bullet points that really, really matter. The first one is relationships matter. I don't know where the obsession with being self-made comes from. I can actually, maybe that's a lie. Like I think that there's a lot of like the stories we tell, especially here in America, the ones that get proliferated, the ones that they make the movies about, that's where it comes from. But I find the words being self-made to be a massive fallacy. And I wish that someone would have told me early on, especially the ego-driven, you know, competitive kid like me of like, oh, well, don't listen to him. He had a bunch of help. Or like, oh, well, you can't follow her path because her business partner, investor, parents like did something to, to help her in this weird way. In fact... I've gone so far the other way that I believe that trying to be self-made is actually playing on hard mode where you don't get any extra reward at the end. Your employees, your vendors, your customers, your peers, your contractors, your acquaintances, your mentors, your critics, your reviewers, your family, everybody, everything contributes to your success that you achieve. And so to me, You'd be better off fostering those relationships and leveraging them for greater opportunities rather than trying to go it alone. So as an example, I had a relationship that I've been building for 12 years finally return financial benefit this year. And now that it's finally happened, it's actually less about the money than I had thought. I was just like massaging this relationship to like hopefully be fruitful in the end. 
I actually think the coolest part is actually like working with these people that I've always wanted to work with. And so as I talk about projects like the podcast, where it's like it gets the least number of views, it's not like it takes the most amount of time, but it's like it is the most like reputationally intensive uh, uh, piece of project that I have going. And so for me, it's like I use my time in terms of professional relationships and continuing to foster those. And I'm going to continue to do more interviews in 2023. Building on that, a huge life hack for relationships is to consider how they impact your reputation. So a funny reframe for this that might help you is if you're struggling with your reputation right now, regardless of where you're at in your career, the trick might not be more accolades or more skills or more time, but it might be in better or more or higher quality relationships that does the trick for you. I think that a lot of us, especially the introverts, we might think that, oh, well, I'm thought of as blank. And so to prove them wrong or to prove that I really am the best, I'm going to go off and do this. I'm going to get another award. I'm going to increase the skill. I'm going to spend more time on this thing. And in reality, like maybe that's not the way to get to the solution, which is a better reputation. It's like you actually need, we're, we're, we're social beings, right? And we're often mimetic, right? If no one's hanging out with you, it's like that also is a signaling mechanism to others that like, oh, don't hang out with this person. And so if you want to fix that, you'd almost be better off increasing your quality of relationships. I hope this is all making sense. And the next, it's it's kind of a mental model. It's almost just like, again, something I just wish someone would have told me, which is like aim high, but also remove the ceiling. Everybody's heard of that. Shoot for the moon. You'll, if you miss, you'll land among the stars anecdote. But what happens if you do hit the moon? Are you just going to stop? And so that's why aim high and remove the ceiling. And so in 2022, I learned the value of doing both and having it be possible to exceed your expectations. I hadn't quite really wrapped my head around the kind of like think and grow rich, you know, mindset until this year. I just figured, of course, we all want to make more money. But the idea of just thinking your way into goals is like the least interesting mindset that you can offer someone like me. I hate the like secret manifesting, just just believe it, w words of affirmation in the mirror, just believe it. I like action. I like being able to like prove it to myself. I like evidence. But there were some beliefs on where the ceiling was for me that were not serving me. And when I realized that it was almost like an exaggerated version of the thermostat problem. And so for those that haven't heard, if you have your thermostat in your house set at 68 degrees, lower temperatures kick on the furnace, right? And the higher ones, when it gets too hot, will shut off the thermos, the, the furnace. My money thermostat was somewhere around $5,000 a month. I don't happen to have a bunch of grand plans that I would do with money, at least in 2021. Again, after switching my mindset a little bit, that has changed. And that's how I spent the first six months of 2022. Once I flipped that and I said, okay, this isn't a character trait problem. This isn't a skill problem. This is a belief problem that you have. For whatever reason, you just like, you make $5,000 and you just turn off the gas and you just don't go for it. And it's like you, in the industry I'm in, the work that I do now, it's like, it's incredibly long-term. It's not like I just go into work and I collect a check for $1,000 and I come home and I just have to do that five times and I can come home. It's like a lot of this is like 90 days two months, six months worth of planning and negotiating and shooting and production and editing and all of this stuff. And so if I hit a goal and it's like, I don't have a plan for how I'm going to do it again, it really bites me in the butt. And so when I asked myself, what would making $20,000 a month look like? That's what I was able to, when I was able to really shift everything. And that's what I hit for the last three months of 2022. I even hit a $25,000 a month in November. And so I'm taking this into 2023. And I know that I said that I, I'm i not really like setting goals or like saying what I'm going to achieve. But like, I want to have a $50,000 a month this year. TBD, if it's going to happen, it's probably going to be a 2024 thing. But like that, it is so much more realistic for me to think about that now. And I want to talk about how that changes my decision making too. So 
I want to talk about going beyond no. So after years of saying yes, I was a yes man. If you read previous playbooks, I talk about the idea of having a portfolio of opportunities. And in that stage of life, it was incredibly helpful because I needed to know that this wasn't what I wanted to do, that I could try this and I was capable here, but it wasn't going to make enough money. Or I didn't really like the, tr the, the downsides that came with this type of project or this type of work. I didn't really like working with these types of people. I needed to do that to figure out all of the options on the table. I needed to taste everything and then get to a place where I was like, okay, this is what I know I want to be doing. And so to combat being a, such, a, such a yes person, I found myself starting to say no more in 2022. And I've been doing it even more in 2023. I think in the first quarter of 2023, I turned down like $40,000 worth of cooking events and like engagements and dinners and things that people ask me to do. That's crazy to have, you, if you would have told 2017 Justin that, he'd have been like, dude, are you stupid? Taking it back a little bit, I would literally have this conversation in my head where I would say, okay, you want a $20,000 month. There's a $750 opportunity. Is that, are you gonna get to $20,000 this month by saying yes to that $750 opportunity? And the answer was almost always no. And so for me, this like money goal, which again, money is like a tool to me. I'm I'm so indifferent about money as a as a thing to push for. But putting that on a pedestal actually really helped a lot of these other behaviors and decision making things that I was doing that again were were really harming me. Like they were really I was I was saying yes to things, I was helping people, I was I was spending my time on things that were not helping me in the, in the, in the long term. And so setting money as as actually the thing that I was tracking instead of saying yes to the $750 thing, I would spend that time working on the $5,000 thing or the $10,000 thing instead. And notice how the math breaks down on that. You need two $10,000 things to hit a $20,000 month versus how many $750 things do you need? And so this slight shift to what I wrote about in 2019, it makes all the difference. And so I talked about saying no a little bit in 2019, I think. And so if no was just what we wanted to optimize for, I would set up an autoresponder that declined every email. And so that's why I, talk, I call this section of the playbook going beyond no. Because the magic isn't in saying no itself. It's what no allows you to do afterwards with that space that you've just made available that really drives outsized returns. And I think a lot, that's why saying no is so hard because people look at that and they're like, I can't say no. What am I, what am I going to have available? And it's like, you need to do both. You need to say no. You need to bounce it off of whatever metric you set. I don't want to be doing this anymore. I want more space for this. I want to be working with these kinds of people. For me, it was, I wanted to have this amount of monetary value. It's more about quality and nuanced decision-making versus having it be a binary rule. Don't get me wrong, there will be a season of my life where I can have a true season of no, where I just say no to everything. For me right now, navigating complex decision-making over long time horizons, that's what I need to be doing, and so that's what I focus on. The next stop point on work is stacking skills over stacking experience. So I finally saw the result of seemingly unrelated progressions that I've been building over the past five years really hit their stride. And I'm reminded of this advice from Scott Adams of combining different skills from different disciplines to truly become unique. And so for me, I feel world-class at cooking professionally, creating content, negotiating, and teaching in a way where I can combine these to make orders of magnitude more than I, if I was just using one of those skills. So if I just decided to just do cooking, don't make any content, don't do negotiating, I could have a $50,000 a year job, but I could 10X that by combining it with other things. Chase Jarvis has this quote where he says, forget better or different, think only. Kevin Kelly, similar quote, he says, don't aim to be the best at something, aim to be the only. And so that really sticks with me when I see comments from you folks come through where you say, nobody on the internet is making content like this for chefs. 
And I, I, I previously I've just looked at that and I've been like, eh, cool. All right. And don't get me wrong. It's like, it's awesome to hear, but I'm really like, oh, like you have really done it. Like, like David Prell t t writes about this personal monopoly thing. I've written about it in previous playbooks, but it's kind of like, I have a bit of a personal monopoly and it's like, I need to treat it with that type of respect and stop <laughs> getting guilty over turning down a private dinner. You know what I mean? Because like there are private chefs who are great private chefs, but it's like, I found this thing that I am unique and I can be the only at. And I, I, I chuckled to think about the fact that I would like not continue to just pour resources into this thing that I built over something else that is more unidimensional. I think the reason that it's hard is that it's non-obvious as a route. Because skill stacking is more valuable than experience for me, but it definitely goes against conventional wisdom. Because what might people say? Oh, you're really good at cooking. Keep doing that. That is your strength. Lean into that, right? We hear that advice all the time. I remember when I first started taking on freelance video clients. You you have this sweet video editing gig. That's awesome. Like, keep doing more of that. Like, why would you stop doing more video stuff? Because it's hard and not immediately beneficial to say, that's awesome that I can make this doing video stuff, but I'm going to pursue this new skill path. I'm going to try to combine it with something else. Because there's a lot of people who get stuck and they just know how to make good water bottles. It's the only thing they know how to do. If they could get really good at graphic design, could have graphically designed water bottles. Poor example. Sorry. But by definition, when you try to stack skills, you're giving up time that you could be spending getting more experience at that thing you're already good at or have opportunities in. And that's where it's paradoxical because it doesn't really make sense in the moment. But I can tell you what's on the other side of that, if you can manage to do it right, is this one plus one equals three outcome that I think we're all trying to look for. And what I share at the end of this section is nearly all of my high income opportunities this year came from the fact that I'm multidisciplinary. So the fact that I drove course sales, the fact that I got this sponsorship with like cooking and making content, the fact that I got some really nice dinners because I was like really good at negotiating and knew how to cook really well. It's like all of this together was why I was able to achieve the financial success that I did in 2023, 2022. All right, next point on the work category is segmenting for identity. I kind of talked about this at the start of the video, but to folks watching, it might have caused some confusion to you when I launched Repertoire this past year. And I'll admit, I didn't really have a clear plan when I made that video, when I launched the brand, when I made the website. At least in these early days, my content and Repertoire's content appear to like Venn diagram like a lot. But use this piece of content as an example. I talk about health, I talk about entrepreneurship, I talk about money, I talk about family, and I only do this once a year. And to me, the chef-focused audience that I've built over the past six years is more focused on techniques and skills and professional experience. It wouldn't make sense for me to publish this playbook on Repertoire's channels, and that's how I know I've done something right. Like I know what type of content Repertoire is for. And as I lean into this, I separated them in the rebranding that happened in 2022. It's not the Justin Kana show. It's not Justin's list as a newsletter anymore. It's not justinkana.com slash course anymore. Everything has been segmented and it took time to do that. But I failed into leaning into publishing on my own accounts on Justin Kana's Instagram. I don't really tweet that much. I don't make TikToks as, as, as much as I should. But I look forward to changing that in 2023. And part of it is that big rant that I went on at the beginning of this video, which is like, I need to be sharing more and being a human, right, on some of these platforms. This also comes with a little bit of a weird shift in identity. Like, since 2009, 2010, I've told myself I'm a chef. Like, that's been my how I introduce myself. That's been what I put on like the passport stuff that you fill out when you're at the airport, when you're going into a new company country, what's your occupation? I've said chef for so long and I'm beginning to shed that label. I'm stepping more into the, I don't know what it is. It's like the, the founder role, the entrepreneur role, like whatever that title, the, the educator role, 
that's what I want to be able to step into. Ideally, you get to this place where, like, you do something that, like, really solidifies it as, like, you have an exit or you write a book and people can say that you're something. But it's like, I've talked about this on multiple shows. I define a chef as someone who works with food and has a sense of responsibility towards it. And it's like, I work with food, like, two days a month. So it's like, why do I call myself a chef when I spend so much of my time doing other stuff? And if I'm being honest, it's a really challenging transition. I'm suffering with all the associated side effects. Sunk cost bias, imposter syndrome, and doubt. I suffer with all of that. And I had to continually remind myself that this is what hard feels like. like. If you want to be able to tell the stories of like how you went from here to here and you want it to be this hard story, like this is the hard part, right? And I, I, I need to tell myself that because there are days when I feel like it's not worth it. I just want to give up today. And it's like, if you think about it, we all want to be seen as these like multifaceted, complex beings. But I had to remind myself that like, again, look at your own user behavior. Everybody's busy. Humans aren't good at holding multiple ideas in their head. If I look at any of the people that I look up to, of course they're more than the book that they wrote. Of course they're be- they're they're more complex than the album that they wrote or the dish that they made. But it's like you almost need to lean into that a little bit to give somebody something to hang their hat on. My old business partner used to say that a lot. People don't know what to know you for. It's going they're, you're, they're going to dis- you're going to dissolve in their brain. And I push back on being put in a box over previous years. I don't know why I did, but I did. But now I see the value in being the blank guy. Like, I kind of want to be the total station nomination guy or the station guy, right? Like, the restaurant station guy. Like, I feel like I can be world class at that. And so, I don't exactly know how this manifests, but like, this is what I'm thinking about on the day today. Because think about it like this even if folks mischaracterize you, so let's say we take Rene Redzepi as an, as, as an example. If you call him, The chef who serves ants. That's not wrong. Like, you could totally characterize Rene Redzepi as the chef that serves ants. But at least they're talking about you. I would prefer that rather than the person who says, well, I don't really know how to describe what he does. Because that doesn't exactly inspire confidence, right? If they're talking about you, at least then the... You can develop some super fans and those can be your evangelists and those can be the ones that describe you in a really thoughtful way. And I think the reason that I felt so lost in previous years is because I had the skills, but I was missing the entrepreneurial beliefs to chart a path towards business success of my own. I plan to trust in the deep work that I've done over the past few years to outline this path and rely on consistency, doing the boring work, being as vulnerable as I think is like minimum effective dose of vulnerability to carry me into this next chapter. Next up, I want to talk about multiple eggs, having multiple eggs, juggling multiple balls. So coming out of 2021, I was pretty beat down. I was really uncertain for the future. There was every reason for me to throw in the towel and just go get a job in a kitchen. I really, I didn't consider it that intensely, but it was like, it was always something where I was like, if it really goes south, that's going to be the plan. And when I look back on it, like there was several moments where like I probably should have or could have done that. And what I think saved me was the fact that I had multiple eggs in different baskets. None of them were producing enough to sustain me in a consistent way. So to fix this, I I, I focused, I created systems behind each and every one of those eggs so that I could not just grow them, but not rely on a single one. And so here's an approximation for how my income broke down in 2022. So about 15% of it was like consulting, 25% of it was sponsorships and brand deals, 30% of it was cooking. So this is private dinners, this is cooking classes, stuff like that. 15% was course sales and the community membership that I run. And then 15% of it was coaching that I do with you folks. This becomes increasingly key as multiple uncertainties become more likely. So as the economy is in a turbulent moment right now, clients that would have booked dinners reduce budgets. They downsize their team so there's less guests at a dinner. I also don't have that big of a team anymore. And so I think about that a lot as what if that goes down? Brands that would have sponsored end up doing the same thing. 
they have less marketing spend, the contracts de decrease in scope and, and scale, and the ones who previously were interested are no longer pursuing partnerships anymore. So I need to protect myself from that downside. Also, companies that could afford consulting are no longer se seeking those types of services. And with my wife and I growing our family over the next few years, I'm not sure I want to set up with complex overhead and heavy, you know, people heavy as an event com company was running. I know how complex that was. I did that for almost four years. But that, and, and also, that is a job income generating machine that relies on me to be the face of the operation. And so I've given downsides on four of those five. Coaching, community, courses, basically the only three things that Repertoire does, they aren't really affected by any of this. I can do it remotely. I can set it up where it doesn't have to be my face as the one that's doing the fulfillment. And it can be something that scales without a ton of overhead or people. And so I'm not naive to the fact that certain audience members are going to stop purchasing the course. They're going to pause their membership if their income is affected, if the economy goes down. But in that type of environment, I'm kind of hedged in, in this funny way because there's also a large influx of folks who don't have jobs and are interested in making more money, right? So like if I can offer, I can basically, you know, play both sides of the swing in that case. And so I'm hedged in either direction. You also might notice that like I haven't pared it down completely. I still have other eggs as part of my basket, but I, but that's because I want the flexibility to have products and services fail until they reach product market fit. And I also just like the skill development of trying out different things. I think so many things were like 20%, 20%, 20%, 20% across five things. I want it to be more 80% of my income is coming from repertoire and 20% is coming from these additional things. That's ideally where I want to get to. And what's really helpful with that is I can be completely bootstrapped. I don't have an investor breathing down my neck. And then I can be the one who's generating the cash flow and deciding what to do with it versus like, oh, I have this. I like I know what it feels like to have a $30,000 a month payroll that you have to be you know, responsible for. It's a weird feeling. Like it puts it's a lot of pressure because like people's families, like you're worrying about people's families and are they going to make their mortgage? And like you make decisions like, oh, I'm I'm not going to pay myself for like the first 10 days of this month because like I'm going to wait for I'm going to pay my people. I'm going to wait for the check to come in and then I'm going to pay myself. Like, at that point, said another way, I think I understand why people raise money now. And I didn't in, in, in previous years. I'm also attempting something incredibly ambitious with the types of products that I'm creating for repertoire, things that don't exist. And each one, I just want to dive into it just really quickly in case you didn't know what repertoire does. So the courses that we make, most hospitality courses are incredibly stale and not adaptable. You watch someone make something on screen and maybe you get like a recipe document with it, right? The masterclass that you watched over the weekend isn't going to save you at 7 p.m. on a Saturday night. It just won't. Not to mention that same type of content is available in mass for free on YouTube and on short form platforms like Instagram and TikTok. So why would I pay to watch a chef make salmon in Papillote? Like it doesn't make sense to me. And where I also get frustrated for is like there's a lot of things that people tout as industry knowledge, but it's never actually been quantified. And so that's what I do the work of in courses like Total Station Nomination, in the DTO framework for creativity. Community. Most hospitality communities are painfully unmoderated, they're cringy, and they're full of complaining. I have never left the Kitchen Confidential subreddit more inspired or proud of the industry. I leave reading people's threads of complaining and bitching and talking about how like, oh, I hate this because so-and-so fucked me over and whatever, whatever. In fact, I never identified with the Kitchen Confidential subreddit or the True Cooks Instagram. Talked about this on more and more podcasts recently. And so I'm trying to build something different. So Repertoire's community is full of weekly challenges. We talk about news. We talk about gear. Things that are positive and productive. And I also do live sessions. Like I would have loved to have, you know, joined like a like a a live session with one of these communities early on in my career, but like they just didn't exist. And so they do exist with repertoire. And lastly, coaching. So most clients, so 90% of clients that I work with co for coaching who end up booking with me, I ask them as a questionnaire, "Have you ever done professional coaching before?" And again, 90% of them say no. 
And so I didn't even know of a single type of person offering coaching this type of service when I was in kitchens full time. And so I'm overjoyed to see the success of clients that I help coach by really digging in on stuff, making a plan, working through your goals, and really giving you a path to achieve them. It's been really, really satisfying. And, and, and again, there's no one to really compare me to, but I know based on the success of the clients that it's working. And so again, I can't really put my full force of confidence behind it or try to raise money on it yet because it's like I need to know exactly where it stands in the market and when it has product market fit, it's kind of been building over the past three years, then I'm really going to, like I'm using it as a variable in what's going to make repertoire successful versus like, oh, I'm launching a chef coaching business. I hope this is all making sense. And so again, I talked about those 80-20 numbers. I've set targets on each of these categories for 2023. And if I'm able to hit them, it's going to allow me to reinvest massively in 2024 for some even more exciting benefits for members and for students. So to ensure that I don't pursue any short-term behavior with any of these three courses, community, coaching, I'm effectively axing cooking for 2023. Like I basically said no to every single cooking thing, aside from one pop-up I did this year. And what I'm basically going to do is rely on supplementary income from sponsors and consulting to make sure that I can continue to pay my own bills, stay bootstrapped, and continue to build so that I can really go ham in 2024. I realize this is not the cleanest way to do that. To do it, I realize there are probably faster ways where I could accomplish this, but it allows me to be flexible and adaptable and take risks and go slow. I think that like rushing into this and putting out a shit quality product would not make me feel good, and so I'm trying to avoid that. Another point on on work, value isn't always monetary. Speaking of coaching, I've told a lot of you folks this in coaching calls. I've mentioned using negotiation as a skill that I feel world-class at. And while I've still got room to grow and a lot to learn on the negotiation side, I've learned that really what comprises negotiation is a cocktail of human psychology, underlying motivations, incentives, timing, levers, decisions, risk, trust, the list goes on. And the way that I was able to develop this was through my negotiations that I would sit in with, with my business partner, Jade at Voyager's Table, and we would talk to clients, and I listened to exactly what language someone with a $20,000 budget needed to hear, someone with an $80,000 budget, someone with a $200,000 budget, what language would they respond to, the follow-up questions that they would ask, the expectations that they would bring, the level of execution that was required from us to back up that type of service. I studied the emails. I really internalized the language and I got really good at it. And I read books like I I read Never Split the Difference. You learn even more about like the really high stress negotiations. Chris Voss, I think, is the author and he was like the, the FBI's hostage negotiator. And it's a fascinating mix of like it's mystifyingly simple and it's also wildly tangled and complex negotiation. And so for me, there were several moments in 2022 where I saw the value in these non-monetary pieces that would get brought into a negotiation. And I plan on improving that muscle even more this year. I plan to listen more, improve that skill, lean into relationships, optimize for longevity over a quick payday, and it's all really, really going to help. And speaking of paydays, I also firmly believe that money isn't always the best benefit to optimize for. Again, I talked about the benefits that I experience when you do decide to do it, But as I talk about relationships, as I talk about playing the long game, once I have, quote unquote, enough dollars to sustain the business, I'm going to start asking for things that money can't buy. Things like access, things like opportunities, things like partnerships and collaborations. That's what's going to happen going forward. I think I have way too many friends, and I won't name them here on this episode, Folks that you folks follow online who are doing some of the biggest collaborations ever. They have tons of followers and they aren't making any money. And they message me about it. And I look at that and I say, there's this quote that I've really loved from, and I'm going to bring them up later from the My First Million podcast, where they talk about this idea of like, you got to get your nut. Like if you're a squirrel, you got to like go out and get your payday, your chunk of change, If it's a cash flowing thing, I talked about this in last year's playbook. 
you have to get yourself, you have to put your oxygen mask on first before you can help others. And so I'm hoping to get the business to a place where it's really starting to generate this good positive cash flow. Or maybe there's an acquired moment. And then it's like maybe in my late 30s I'll start to, like I think about Casey Neistat's age when he started his YouTube channel, like really going daily, daily vlogging. And I think about it in the opposite for myself. It's like if I if I could if I hit a hundred thousand subscribers tomorrow, what would it change for me? And it's like it doesn't do anything for me if I don't have these things in my business in check. And so that's why I'm starting to focus on this a little bit more. I have a quick thing on B2B. I might even delete this from the playbook. The difference between B2B stuff and B2C stuff. It's just a quick nerdy learning thing that I had. There's a guy named Chris Doe. He has a company called The Future. And he makes products and has coaching and community for graphic designers and creatives, basically. And I really wanted to model repertoire after him and what he's built. And the issue, the thing that I wish I would have seen, message to my past self, is that a lot of these creatives and artists are freelancers. So them upskilling themselves is a B2B, B2C relationship, business to consumer business a customer and so it makes sense for him to market the way that he markets to price the way that he prices to go after the people that he wants to go after but for me it's like there's a lot of people especially in the hospitality industry not a lot of us work solo a lot of us work at restaurants or in catering companies or in teams so it's a little bit silly for us to lean into like i should be going b2b in a way that christo cannot because if he goes after the big graphic design firm, it's like they probably have their own internal standards. And so he's really made a, a, a niche for himself in going after the solo folks. And I have been, I, I did it the wrong way. I've been going after the individual folks when I need to be going for culinary, larger culinary schools. I need to be going for larger, you know, like two unit restaurant groups. And so that is a really interesting mental model. It's also helped change the product, which I'm going to talk about next. Because in order for it to be adaptable enough to go across different organizations of size and scope and location, the products have to improve and they really have to be watertight. Which leads me to, again, that next point on product. And the headline here is like product over everything. The best way to get someone to buy your thing, your product, your service, your offering, is to have it happen by word of mouth. You the business, you don't have to spend any money, you don't have to spend any time, any resources, and you get a new customer. It's pretty magical. On top of that, it's the only way to get new customers that is quadratic. And so one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, and it balloons pretty quickly. However, if no one is giving you word of mouth in your business, you start to think, oh, well, maybe I should start running some ads. Maybe we should start marketing. Maybe we should start making content. And if you start to have trouble marketing, none of our videos are getting views. No one's clicking through our ads. You start to consider sales strategies. Maybe I should jump on the phone with XYZ person. Maybe I should host a webinar so I can talk to my customers one-on-one. -on -one. And so it's this like downstream ripple effect. And if we all know this to be true, at least people like me have done a lot of reading on it, at least in the past couple of months, wouldn't it make sense to just focus on getting the product to be so good that people feel compelled to share it? Think about that a lot. Like, instead of trying to make content, wouldn't I have been better off just like making better dishes when I was doing my pop-ups? And again, it's like the theme of this freaking playbook is belief change. This belief change, inspired by people like Naval, Gary V, Mr. Beast, Alex Hormozzi, and others has completely shifted on how I think about repertoire as a business. And I also started to see in myself why I love product reviews so much. I love geeking out about products because I have a real fondness for great product design, practicality, usefulness, features. And I get an immense amount of value from the, from the great products in my life that I love. It also hit me really hard sucks to say, when I could trace back every single flub or every single failure after my entrepreneurial journey started about six years ago, 
to product related reasons. Again, I gave that pop up dinner example. I would like not make a product. So I'd make a different thing every time. I would poorly develop the product. So I would like kind of just half ass refining it. I would not have any consistency in the product. I would label it as a product, but like every single time you got it, it was different. And then I would not pursue things like product market fit because I would say, Justin, you're so different from all these other people. Like you don't need to worry about product market fit. And it's like, that's why you're struggling, dude, because you don't have product market fit. And so after this change in belief, it feels like the doors have been blown off. Like I have wide open pasture to like graze on now and run. And I'm finally being able to step into like a builder role in 2023. And I just, I, I wish I would have taken this advice to heart a little bit earlier. All right, this one is quick. That ends the work section. We go into wealth now. So TLDR on wealth is that I smashed through my financial goals for 2022. I have no problem sharing my revenue numbers. It was over $170,000 in revenue as a solopreneur over the past year. I have no employees. I have a couple contractors that I work with, but it's just me. And it just seems silly. It, it kind of fe feels weird to combine or, or keep these separate because for me right now in this season of my life, wealth and work are kind of one and the same. But there's a lot of stuff I've learned about wealth generation over the past couple of years, and I want to share it here. And it's non-trivial because in previous years, the separation between the two that I was trying to make was really detrimental to the goals that I had. And so I want to talk about why they've converged so much, when they will diverge, and what I've learned kind of along the way. So thing that, you know, most people don't want to hear, it's like when you're talking about money, the G word, gratitude. I also mentioned the E word, which is enough, when I have enough money. And when people hear that word enough, it conjures up goals of slowing down or scaling back or resting on your laurels. And the paradox for me is that the desire for more keeps going, keeps me going, but when I hit the goal, it doesn't satisfy the underlying inadequacy. I think a lot of people notice that. And the fix, at least from what I've read and what I've personally experienced, is just more gratitude. All of us have heard it a million times. It's like the big thing that gets touted on social media with like inspirational, motivational speakers these days. But the real magic for me came when I found a process that fired all the right neurons and dopamine receptors for me. So I'll share what works for me and you can do with it what you will. Let's invert it really quick. Just to talk about the worst possible gratitude practice that you could have for me, which is every morning write three things that you're grateful for. That would be like if a loved one sent you, for me, it would be like if a loved one sent me a text message every morning at 9 a.m. that said, I love you. Sure. The first week, it's awesome. Oh, yeah, this person loves me. Oh, yeah, this person loves me. But after that, it feels really artificial. It feels like you're just going through the motions. It doesn't really mean anything. And I felt that every single time I would have those journaling prompts of write three things that you're grateful for today. Because it's like you get through your one that you might actually be grateful for, and then you just kind of like flub through the next two. Or maybe you do two because something happened that where you're like, oh, I'm really grateful for this. And then the third one, you're just like, I just really need to just like keep going and let's, uh, let's just check the box. And so for me, to build in constraints, I cannot talk about nebulous concepts when I'm journaling about gratitude. I can't say family. I can't say shelter. I can't say coffee. All of that's off the table. It's also a single line in my journaling prompt on my Notion database. So I can't wax on forever about blah, 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 blah. And so it's like, it's very concise and quick. So I have to be short and sweet and to the point. So... Another thing that helped me with gratitude is looking at two different timescales. So micro and macro. So micro gratitude for me is focused on in the moment occurrences that give me that like, huh, moment. The sun looked really awesome when it was rising this morning. I'm so grateful that like our house faces east. So when I get up in the morning and it's that time of year and I can just go look at the sun rising. Huh, that's super cool. Maybe it's one of our house plants has a new leaf. That's awesome. Like do all this work to water them and put them in the right place where they can get some sun. It's really cool. I'm really grateful that there's like a new leaf and that plant is still alive so I can still have some green in our living room. I might even go dark with it where it's like, I'm sore from squatting yesterday. 
Like I have legs that that work. Not a lot of people have that. Huh. That's pretty nice. Maybe it's I got to see a close friend for dinner last night. It's been a really long time since that's happened. Huh. And then I can zoom all the way out, right? We can talk about macro gratitude. And I think this has been gaining popularity over the past few years, and I've gotten value from it, which is the frame of the 80-year-old. And so you project yourself into old age, and you ask yourself, what about right now would I kill to have when I'm 80? And the gratitude nearly takes care of itself. Your eyes work, your hair's not gray, you don't have arthritis in your elbows, your back doesn't hurt, I can see clearly without glasses, my face doesn't have any wrinkles, although I do have some gray hair. I got my first beard, gray beard hair this year. It's very weird. Nobody needs to help me out of a chair. Again, the gratitude takes care of itself when you project yourself that far out. And the reason I bring this up at the start of the wealth section is because so much of what I see ailing people, us as individuals, when it comes to happiness is from the comparison games that we play. The old comparison is the thief of joy quote applies here. If you can get really good at 1v1ing your own subconscious, you can avoid the trappings that everybody else gets sucked into. And this certainly connects with the meditation habit that I talked about in the health section. And so this practice of gratitude, when I'm feeling like I don't have enough, mixed with the chain parish ism which i think he stole from warren buffett of being pleased but not satisfied when it comes to what you're doing means that you get to keep working and keep growing without sacrificing happiness along the way cuz i think that that's the big rub that i want to avoid i don't want to forego being happy by just working and working and working with the hope or the, the again the fallacy that when I hit blank, I will finally allow myself to be happy. I think that you can get there much faster. I think we can come to terms with the fact that like there is a lot to be grateful for now that helps us stay in the game longer. It helps you be more appreciative. It makes sure that you don't burn a bunch of bridges and you make that $5 million and then all of a sudden you look around and nobody's there. All things I want to avoid. So I have to say that at the top of the wealth section. Talking about money stuff, I want to talk about low-stress investing. I put out content about investing. I think it's incredibly valuable. I think if you're not investing in some way, shape, or form, you're doing yourself a disservice. But to me, low-stress investing means decreasing the stress on my time as well as the stress on my mental capacity when it comes to investing my money. So in 2020 and 2021, like many folks, I leaned into active and intensive investment behavior. It was a crazy market. You put $100 in, you come back three months later, it's worth 150 bucks. It's like, what in the world is going on? What I failed to realize was the combination of the fact that, one, it was a crazy market dynamic. Two, I don't have a competitive advantage when it comes to investing. Anytime that I'm making an investment decision, it's from secondhand information. Somebody else, an expert, got the, got the information, they did the research, they talked to the founder... They were behind the scenes on the product development side, and they're telling me the information. So I'm one degree of separation, most likely two away from where that com competitive advantage really lies, and it's often late. So they got the information, they probably bought into the thing, they had to spend the time to produce the content, 24 hours, 48 hours later that piece of content comes out, and I'm getting the information way too late. Too many other people have already bought in, the upside is way it's marginally decreased from when I should have invested. Secondly, the size of my investable capital, even outsized returns, wouldn't eclipse me working more on my business. And so I'll, I'll, I'll give some rough numbers as, as an example. I would tell myself, all right, Justin, you need to make, you need to take this $30,000 that you have and you need to invest it with the hope of you'll get maybe a 15% return on it. That is $4,500 that in the grand scheme of things, it's like it doesn't really do that much for your net worth. But it's like, instead, I should have just taken a step back, said, would $300 a month, $3,000 a month 
like take it orders of magnitude away from thirty thousand dollars and think about that being something that you just slowly just invest passively doesn't take you any time because what happens when you have thirty thousand dollars to invest you overanalyze for me that's a lot of money you're stressing I want to be well-researched. I want to make sure I'm hedged. I want to know the alternatives. You get really emotional about it. Oh, maybe I'll put $10,000 in now and then $5,000 in a little bit and then I'll, I'll pour the other fifteen grand in when it's time. And it's like you could have spent that time doing more because you're trying to get 40, you're trying to squeeze an extra $4,500 out of what, you know? That's also hopefully thinking about the fact that you will know when to sell. You will sell at the exact opportune time when you've made 15% and it's not going to be a little bit too soon because you could have made 20% returns. Idiot. I think about that a lot. The other thing that I failed to realize is that a lot of these pieces of investment advice are being given to pe from people who are in their 50s, they're in their 60s, they're in their 70s. They've been investing for ages. And so I'm looking at how they're making their investing moves and I'm like, oh, I need to be doing that. Not understanding the fact that I have a substantial amount of time remaining in my investment career, which means that I can just let compounding do its magic and be pretty well off at retirement age. So all of these factors together, I don't have a competitive advantage. I don't have like millions of dollars that I'm swinging around in investable capital. And I have a massive amount of time left in my investment career to allow for compounding makes for active investing to be a pretty poor use of my time. And I'm talking, I was spending five hours, 10 hours a week on research, stressing over when to place a trade, comparing decisions, agonizing over it. And the failure stemmed from being caught up in the fallacy, again, another belief problem, that I would be able to achieve a level of wealth that would cause me to stop working. That's genuinely what I thought. I would think to myself like, oh, well, if you make this trade just right, it's going to whatever increase in, in, in amount and get you to a point where you're not going to work, not going to work anymore. Like, that's not me. And even as I was writing this, it was incredibly therapeutic for me to admit the fact that even if I woke up tomorrow and there was $10 million in my bank account tomorrow, I would still want to be doing what I'm doing now. Again, huge belief problem. So therefore, I just need to accept that this lesson cost me some time to learn. I still have all those assets that are working for me. Very, very grateful that I spent the time to learn at least the basics and to at least get all that set up so now that when I do have extra funds, I just set, set it and forget it. But I need to just go back to principles that I've shared in previous year's playbooks around automated, diversified, boring, and low-cost investing. Once the business either has a liquidation event or achieves cash flow that allows for like angel investment opportunities, I've talked about that in previous playbooks, that is something that I want to do in future years, I will deploy capital in a way that I can influence through my audience, I can advise them, I can use my network to, to, to again, have a competitive advantage. But right now, that's, that, that's not the best use of my time. So saying all of this a little bit differently... I took my eye off the ball a little bit too early in 2022. I was like, you're an investor now. Like, you're going to you're going to make so much money off of these percent increase in returns. And I should have just stayed the course. The place where I need to build wealth right now is in my business, not in investable assets. So that's how I'm thinking about wealth going into 2023. All right, next, family. This category, as promised, is near approaching it kind of is my number one priority in a way that it has not been in any other time in my life in my 20s i was focused on work start of my 30s i was like a little bit too much too focused on wealth changing my relationship with work a little bit but i truly believe that like my 30s will be remembered as a family focused decade so the first category to just you know get it get it off my chest right off the bat is called paternal excitement, and that's because I'm going to become a dad in 2023. And the interesting part about it, the perplexing part about it is you might not actually hear that much about it. This is actually the first time I'm sharing it. The due date is first week of August, and so it's been, 
we knew since Thanksgiving, basically, that we've been pregnant and I haven't shared a peep on it on social media. And I think part of the reason is that I've had a lot of success in keeping my family off of social media. And I think that trend is continuing into this year. I think I want to talk about more high-level principles of parenting and family life and juggling all of it versus the people who do the kind of like document every day, look at what my kid's wearing, look at what they're eating. Again, no shame to any of those folks. If you're contemplating the stopping sharing your family on social media, I will admit it, it, it is a bit of a strange feeling in the beginning. Get those questions from Anna when we finally moved in together and I used to post about her all the time on Facebook and then all of a sudden I would not post about her anymore. Part of it was seeing other high profile people not sharing about their family, reading the Tim Ferriss, why you don't want to be famous article. And I think the reason it's strange to do it in the beginning is because most folks use what they share as a proxy for what they care about. And after a while, I realized that I was really just drawing a clean line in the sand for what I chose to share online. I'm no less myself when I post things. I don't go into character when I jump on my YouTube channel or anything like that. Obviously, you like change your tone a little bit, but it's like if you meet me, most of you, a lot of you folks have met me in person or like we've had calls together. It's like I'm not really that much of a different person than the one that I am online. But when I post things, I keep it audience focused and work focused. I treat it like a job versus treating it like a blog or a, a view into my life. And so there are plenty of tools available for sharing. And this is something that I've had to learn with taking all of this stuff off of social media, which are private, they're not recorded, they're direct. And that's what I do with my family. So think good old fashioned phone calls, group texts, FaceTime calls, or just sending pictures back and forth. And then those pictures stay like isolated to your camera roll or like you make a shared album that's just exclusively to the people that you invite to it. It's really, really beneficial. And so it's like you use technology to, to share, but you're not using technology to share with everybody, right? And this becomes really valuable when I realize that I get to take really thoughtful photos and videos of my family and just share them with us. I know, shocking. And this, for me weirdly holds more weight than publishing it to thousands of strangers who don't know that this is my sister-in-law, this is my nephew, this is my brother-in-law. And ultimately, over time, you have that shock in the beginning, but over time, this decreases the expectation and, more importantly, the ability to draw a false equivalency between how much I share online and how much I enjoyed the time or how much I enjoyed the activity. Because I think a lot of people get trapped there. They're like, well, you didn't you didn't post about this weekend. Did you not have a good time? It's like, oh, that's really toxic. And so where I've landed is like time spent with family is truly for its own sake. And that's a really, really healthy place for me. It's different for everybody. This is not to denigrate anyone who posts a lot about their family online, much less makes a living off of it. I know there's tons of people who are wildly successful sharing about their families. But in the same way that my work, especially in restaurants, like had downsides that many people couldn't stand, like straining fryer oil or raw chicken juice or like my work that I did do as a content creator, like I couldn't stand exporting video analytics for a brand or the downsides of thinking about the, the copy that you're going to write in this week's social media post. Like that sounds like hell to people. For me, the downsides that family posting parents talk about isn't worth the upside to me. And I just don't want to do it. And so, considering this big lifestyle change, becoming a parent, it will cause such a massive shift in lifestyle. I'm going to follow the work family scene, you can only pick two mental model from Austin Kleon, which was popularized by Ryan Holiday. And what that means for me is I'm going to focus on work and I'm going to focus on family. And so scene is going to kind of fall off the map. I'm not going to go to many parties or social engagements or collaborations or do events towards the tail end of 2023 after the baby is born. 2024, probably going to decrease a little bit further. It might come back a little bit once the baby is, you know, like a little bit more substantial. But like, I really want to be around in those first few weeks and months and years. A lot of people talk about like the first five years are really important. A lot of people talk about the first 10. It's like you can't get those back. 
And I'm approaching this with more excitement than distress or like, oh, this is a loss, right? There, there, there's, there's a reason that there was never really like a scene section or a social section of these playbooks, right? In a weird way, like, I, felt, I feel like I've been building towards this moment for the past two to three years already. And so it doesn't feel like this big shock to the system. This was very planned by my wife and I. Like, we really are excited for this to happen. And so that's some fun news. And I'm excited to share it with you folks that it's happening. Not necessarily sure how much you're going to know, you know, like down the line. But like, I plan on at least making a little bit of content talking about the the change that's happened. And this kind of like breaks the seal on it for me. So I'm excited to share that. Another dot point that I've really been leaning into with family is this concept called the last time. And so considering my wife's side of the family has experienced some loss this year, uh, this is pretty recent. It's been almost 10 days. Uh, my mom died 10 days ago as I'm recording this. And she had cancer. And I knew the last time that I saw her, which was two months ago, was going to be the last time. And I kind of brought a little bit of this mental mod obviously no amount of thinking or theory can prepare you for it but having this in the back of my pocket really made sure that I don't have any regrets around the last time that I saw my mom and so it's from Sam Harris no surprise it's featured in this book called 4,000 weeks and Sam shares this idea that there will be a last time that you pick up your kid and in that moment you won't know it and that hit me like a ton of bricks, man. Like, I just heard it, and I was like, I couldn't help but notice it in other parallels, too. And I started to think about the fact that, like, I wonder how much of a lack of appreciation for family and spot time spent with them comes from a combination of, like, the decrease in stakes, right? These are my family. I don't have to... I, they're always going to be around. And proximity bias, right? They're just right here. They're, they just live down the street. We come here every year. When you've literally had 25 holiday seasons in a row with these people, I know for me with certain people in my life, that's that's the case. I see them every year for the holidays. It's difficult to expect any different because how could you know what different feels like? You've never had to experience it. And our brains are conditioned to just expect more of the same. Go on autopilot. In addition to the meditation habit that helps me be more present, and the gratitude habit, which increases my appreciation. Another fun writing prompt that I kind of stole from Ali Abdal, he has a book where he covered, I think it's I think it's called Story Worthy Moment, is asking myself, what is a story worthy moment from yesterday? And so you start to notice, like, how would you tell the story of you got to see so-and-so for a drink? You got to have a meeting with this person. You went for a walk with this person. And you start to notice, like, it it has been proven that it kind of like it has this funny time dilating effect. Like it makes you, it makes time feel longer. Like it, it, and over a long enough time horizon, it will make your life feel longer. I think a lot of us can notice how COVID felt like when you were, when the lockdowns happened, wherever you were, it's like, if you really think back to that amount of time, it like, it seems like two weeks, but a lot of people were stuck in their house for two months. It's like, why can't you remember those two months? Because everything was monotonous and it blurred together in your brain can't segment it into individual moments. And so by doing this practice, I'm really acknowledging the fact that like, if you go out to dinner with your four friends and you go to your favorite place, really understanding like it could be the last time that this ever happens. Really just like, holy shit, like that changes how you experience it. And two, giving yourself again these like chapter markers through something like a journal prompt or you can use voice memos or notes app on your phone, physical journal, to ask yourself, what's a story worthy moment from yesterday? Give yourself that ability to help you remember your life. Because think about it, we're story loving creatures. And so crafting a story around seemingly mundane events, so getting lunch with your mom, visiting your grandpa for his birthday, can really help to layer these benefits together. Plus, who knows if your story is literally documenting the last time that that's ever going to happen and being able to look back at that and be like, yeah, cool. On May 1st, I got to see my mom. That's really cool. 
I don't really have much to share on like grief and grieving. I thought that was going to be a section in this. Um, I think a big aid I haven't even written in this. This is going to, I guess, going to be a YouTube exclusive because I don't really want it to be post printed on the internet, I guess, in a blog post format that my mom passed. But it's just this kind of funny thing of like all of these together, I think is what's helped me the most. So I think about the person who goes to meditate and takes cold showers and works out and has positive, optimistic thoughts all the time. And it's like one little pebble in the road of their life can take them completely off track. It's like, well, you you probably don't have those skills all that well developed. And I think about it the reverse with how it's been with my mom passing. Where it's like, this is this is why I do this stuff. Obviously it hurt. Obviously I was sad. But I'm not in some like depressive state of like I can't get out of bed and Again, these things happen differently for everybody. I had months to plan. I've been writing about it in playbooks for like three, four years that my mom's, you know, like my family's health has not been good. I'm finally okay to talk about it now. Like I'm finally putting it out there that like my mom had cancer for a really long time. She wasn't really getting treatment for it and she died 10 days ago. And I think a lot of people don't have that luxury. Like the, I think about like the people who like have their parents get hit by a car or some person breaks into their house and shoots them. That type of an experience is so jarring and so unexpected that I think that would have hit me a little bit differently. For my parents, I know exactly what's going to kill both of them for the most part. One of two, correct? I think it's a combination of like, I have great relationships in my life. The amount of like friends that I've been able to like see and talk with who have also had deaths in the family that, that they can share stories with me. My wife has been incredibly helpful and supportive during all of this. And then all the other just like strong mental like Chris Williamson from the Modern Wisdom podcast, who I'm also going to share a little bit about here in a second, talked about when he had a Achilles tendon rupture he was like i was really shocked at how i navigated the recovery of that because he's like that's why i do all of this stuff the learning the personal development the psychological stability stuff he's like so when something hard happens i don't fold like a cheap napkin i can be there for my family i can help get the stuff done that needs to get done i can continue to show up for my work stuff and I can bounce back to baseline while still processing and feeling. And, you know, this is not sweeping it all under the rug. But I feel the same way about my mom. She passed and it sucked. But it's like, that's why I do all of this stuff. And the, the reason that's important is because I haven't had a loss happen since like my grandma on my Indian side passed when I was 11. So it's been like 20 years since I've had a loss that's like personally affected me is like this person is close to me. And I didn't even, when I was 11, I didn't even know how to process that stuff. And so it's not like this thing that it's been like, I, I've been losing people all the time. And I know what it feels like. This is the real moment where I was like tested on that. And it's not like you can win grieving a parent, but I think that there are certain people who can like cope. They really can. And there are certain people who really cannot, and it really sets them in this negative trajectory. And because they don't have any tools to cope, they just, like, turn to these other places, which is really, really negative. And so I guess that's what I have to say on I'm, I'm, I'm my mom. Like, again, this is only going to be for the YouTube video and the podcast. I'm not going to share this anywhere else. But, yeah, two weird, bittersweet updates that, like, I hate that you had to watch this far in to, like get the family stuff but it's like gonna be a dad wildly excited about that and i lost my mom which is incredibly sad and bitter it's like bittersweet last couple of months for me and so that concludes the family section we're going to go into miscellaneous now so if the preceding categories 
health, wealth, family, work are my rocks. I've got a few pebbles and I've got some sand that I pour into my jar that is my life. If anybody's never heard of that analogy before, it is you fit the rocks in first, you can fit the pebbles in, and then you can fit the sand. But if you do the sand first, then the pebbles, then the rocks won't fit in the jar. And so these are my these are my pebbles and some sand that I'm going to share. So the first one is travel. So New York City remains my favorite city to travel to right now. And I've set up professional relationships to reflect that. And the reason it's my favorite is because there's to me, there's no city where I can get the same mix of phenomenal meals for this place called Episodes, high profile guests for the podcast, meetings with hospitality focused brands that can become sponsors, all in the same place. There are certain cities that eclipse New York on meals, certain cities that eclipse New York on podcast guests, certain cities that eclipse New York on meetings with hospitality focused brands, but New York has the perfect mix of all three where I feel like I can work and play at the same time. And I hope that I can make one more trip to New York before the end of the year. We'll have to see when this baby comes and what that looks like. I wrote here on the playbook that I'm going to be traveling to Japan later this year, making it my third visit to the country so far. Spoiler alert, that visit has already happened. A lot of people have seen that on Instagram. Considering my wife and I had a wedding during COVID, I couldn't have the bachelor party that I would have wanted to have where I had my groomsmen take a trip to Japan with me. That was going to be the plan. And so the reason that I went is because I wanted to travel there with the guy who was my best man and we're looking forward we were looking forward to a really fun trip. It was a really fun trip. It was weird because 2 days before the trip, I went to visit my mom for the last time. She was in the hospital. She ended up living for another month and a half after that. But yeah, it was weird, and I wrote a whole piece about, uh, it's called Burn the Candles, and it is in relation to the fact that, like, if you have an opportunity to do something and, you know, like, you're just contemplating, oh, well, maybe there's a better time. I think a lot of us have those relatives, like, my, my wife's grandma, like, had these candles, and she was like, well, one day we'll have this dinner where we'll burn these candles, and she, she died at the beginning of, at the, uh, yeah, at the beginning of this year, having never burnt those candles. And so if you want to read that piece, that's a really good piece. I relate it to travel because I think travel is one of those funny things where people regret later in life that they didn't get to travel. And I am not going to be the type of person who gets to say that. I've traveled the, the world at this point and I'm 31. And so just really happy that I prioritize that. Um, on the concept of travel, conferences are a travel life hack. It's another thing that I've learned, especially now that I'm in, you know, kind of like a professional stage in my career where I can like get a lot of value from conferences. But I think it's a combination of you get to go to a new place. It's very social and it's almost group focused versus like solo travel focused. Like when I go to New York now, it's very solo focused. But when I go to a conference, like I use the craft and commerce conference in Boise in Idaho as an example, I meet a lot of great people. It's a great excuse to get on the road in a season of my life where I'm less enticed by the kind of like hostile living budget style travel. I just got lucky picking craft and commerce is a good conference utility by till it is a great conference i would have made it to the welcome conference on monday but again with my mom passing so recently i canceled that trip and so if you're at a place where you're kind of like stale with travel conferences are fun like i really like them and i also am cognizant of the fact that like in the founder entrepreneur you know kind of community there's this funny thing with conference overload that can sometimes happen where you have the CEO who goes to like four conferences a month and they're just completely tired and they don't work on their business because they're like, I have to be at this conference. It's It can go a little bit too far. And so I think what I'm trying to tell myself is like somewhere between two and four conferences a year is a really good sweet spot. Considering the trend that I've seen in this post-COVID world is just there's a lot of benefit to meeting in person. And the magic that can happen in those environments is hard to beat. Reading. Audiobooks are where 80% of my reading happens these days. It's definitely not as much as I would hope. I, I wish I was reading more. I've personally leaned more towards YouTube videos and podcasts over reading in the past few months, but I'm a, at a bit of a critical mass with books where I picked them up. I've, it's a little bit of like business. It's a little bit of self-development. It's, it's, it's a lot of parenting books that I have now, which is kind of cool. And I'm just excited to like go on walks with the baby and listen to stuff while they're sleeping. 
basically. And so to influence this behavior, I've added a large format Kindle widget and an Audible widget to my home screen on my phone. And so instead of, and I've also deleted TikTok from my phone. And so instead of going to TikTok and scrolling that, I will go to reading a book or listening to a book instead. Another fun quote on reading, which is kind of motivating a lot of this, is from Andrew Wilkinson, who just took his company Tiny Public. And he says, quote, if I could short founders who don't read, I would. Which basically means if I could bet against founders who don't read, I would. And I do not want to be that founder. I want to constantly be learning. I want to constantly be just like having ideas bounce around and having sex with each other, basically. And so to combat this, I need to avoid looking at reading as separate from working and accept it as part of what makes me great at my job. And so reading books, reading newsletters, listening to podcasts, that helps me become better. It is not something separate from work, if the, all that makes sense. Another one that I spent quite a bit of time on, probably do a little bit less, it actually has been less in the past month or so after a couple of disheartening updates from the game, is I play a lot of Pokemon Go for those that, you know, have either met me in person or who, you know, we've, we, we are friends on Pokemon Go, you know that I play a lot of Pokemon Go. Uh, if this is a weird segment for you to hear, I don't know what to say, just something that I like to do. I love Pokemon as a French franchise. I have a bunch of stuff up here on the thing that's Pokemon related. You can kind of spot in some videos. But yeah, I reached a lot of my collecting goals in 2022. I got a shiny Trubbish. I got a shiny Rog and Rolla through the community, unfortunately, but oh well. As well as I have the first three Pokedexes completed. So Kanto, Johto, Hoenn, I think, are all completed. My big goals for this year is a shiny Darkrai, a shiny Riolu, and then all three Galarian legendary birds, I got Galarian Zapdos in Japan off of the Daily Incense, which is in freaking sane. And I was so happy that I got it there. Um, hoping that Shiny Phantom gets released before the end of the year because Trevenant is on, I think, both of my battling teams. And I would love to have two Shiny Trevenants if that's possible. If you want, my friend code is linked below this video. And if you return to Pokemon Go, you can actually, in the blog post, there's a referral system that Pokemon Go has. So you get a bunch of cool items, and then I get a bunch of cool items for getting you back onto the game. Because everybody remembers that moment in 2016 when the game launched. Uh, there's a ton of more fun stuff to do in the game now than there was ages ago. And it's just like, if I'm waiting in line, instead of like going on Twitter or doom scrolling on Instagram, I'll just open Pokemon Go. Or if I'm walking around, like when I go for my walks, I play a lot of Pokemon Go, which has been cool. In line with that, I've been battling a lot using Go Battle League. And I, that when I talked about playing video games to like decompress after work, I play Go Battle League a lot. And so it's performance focused, it's metrics focused, it's multiplayer. And I can just find utility in a game that I already love. So it's not like I have my playing game and I have my collecting game or my like busy time game. They're both the same game. So I basically have one game on my phone where it's like I don't have Candy Crush and, you know, like a crossword thing and a Star Wars game. I have just one game that I play. And so that tends to be helpful. I'm really trying to hit Legend in like I'm, I'm probably going to hit Veteran this season in the Go Battle League. I've hit Ace every single season. I, I can't seem to hit Veteran, and Legend seems so much further away. But I'm going to use tips from certain YouTubers that I follow, and hopefully I'll hit Legend by the end of this year. The current Great League team that I'm running that I really find the most progress with is Bastidon, Metacham, and Trevenant. And so hopefully that ends up being positive. Didn't know if you expected a you know, Pokemon Go uh, Pokemon yeah, uh, excerpt. Uh, tangent here, but you got one. The last one, uh, no, a couple, uh, couple more. So one is AI and no code. So if 2021 was the year of Web3, which I talked about, I'm still paying attention to it. I still am incredibly bullish on it. 2022 was the year of AI and no code, and 2023 is almost exactly the same. I really want to stay ahead of the curve on it. I really use it a lot to build my business. Almost every single one of my tools that I use uses AI. Here's how I'm using them and what I plan on increasing my use with and why I think they're so important. So mid journey, if you've been on the newsletter, almost every single newsletter over the past, I would say 10 editions 
has had custom art on it from mid journey that I've built. And so same with course stuff. If I need a graphic for the course logos, icons using mid journey, incredibly cool. And they just had a huge update. I haven't had a chance to play with it yet, but using it in combination with like even contractors in the future to like get a version one of a visual that I'm thinking about done. It's really powerful. And if you haven't played with mid journey, I would highly, highly recommend it. Next chat GPT. We tried ChatGPT for writing in, in the team, and I honestly didn't like it. So with ChatGPT 3, GPT 4 is much better. The results were vanilla, and they felt stale, and I don't think that my brand, Justin Connor brand, Repertoire brand, either of them benefit from increased quantity of content. Where I really shine is combining ideas, creating something new by remixing. If I was a you know, vanilla marketing company, and I just needed to put out content for a daily newsletter, I think it would be different. I think that ChatGPT is great for drafting recipes. I put out pieces of content that talk about that. Summarizing podcast transcripts, they're pretty good for that. Sometimes they get it wrong. But we still use them in areas that don't benefit from human involvement. And that's really how I think about it. It's like, would this piece of writing benefit from human involvement? Don't put an AI on it. Make a human do it. Other no-code tools, Notion, Airtable, Make.com, Superhuman, Circle, all these things are getting smarter and more capable. And the humans that are using them are building really, really cool things. My second brain is still in Notion, if anybody wants to, to know that. And I use Make.com versus Zapier. That's also helpful. And all of these could together, right? Like understanding how to look through an API database, what certain functions are available to you and how to go beyond the standard calls that you might make to an API. Stuff like JSON, incredibly helpful. Like I have a really cool automation that I do where in the morning when I turn off my alarm, it goes over to the Aura app, downloads my sleep data, opens a new journal entry in Notion, dumps in my sleep data, and then it's also programmed to when I open my med meditation app, if I click the right button, it automatically documents in Notion that I've meditated that day. So like saves me so much time and it helps make me more cognizant of like going back. And when I start journaling, it's like, why am I in such a bad mood? It's like, oh, well, you haven't meditated today and your sleep score is horrible. It's like, oh, interesting. I should fix that tonight. And I do not have moments where I like sleep like crap for four days in a row or I miss meditation for a month at a time. I miss days here and there. I'm human. But it's like, I use technology to help me be a better human versus like just be aesthetically pleasing on Notion or something like that. All right, hacks and favorites. This is, you know, probably why a lot of you came to this video. I, I, I don't know. Like, you'll have to let me know in the comments what some of your favorite sections were for this. But these are some of just like, the fun things, the things I learned in 2022, and a majority of all of that, the fun that I had was made possible by these few purchases, habits, tips, and I always end the playbooks with this because this is super, super tactical. So the first one, I played God of War Ragnarok. It is incredible. Fun. It's beautiful. It's The gameplay itself was shockingly fluid, and I borrowed my friend's PS5 for this. So I don't have a PS5 anymore, which also is a life hack. Because if you have consoles with a bunch of fun games on them, you're probably going to play those versus doing other things that are probably more important to you, at least for me. Also, yes, I did do all of the post-game challenges too. So if you are a gamer and I was only on the normal difficulty, I was not on the easy difficulty, but I, I didn't go into any of the harder modes. But I did beat all of the Berserkers and the last boss that I won't spoil for you the end. I'm also really loving the web browser from the browser company called Arc. That is my daily driver. It is a new favorite, and I've got it installed on both my laptop and my mobile phone for surfing the web. Google results are faster. Uh, the customizability is great. The fact that I don't have a gajillion tabs anymore is wonderful. I haven't really dug into the customizable color features or text changes that they offer for websites. It's cool to have, but just like them as a company, Really, really cool how they run, like sending their updates, documenting their process, building in public. All that stuff is really, really cool. The next hack, when traveling, choose accommodation that has a gym in it. 
And so for my training goals, I feel way better about time away from my normal routine if I have a gym nearby that ideally has at least a Smith machine or something with cables and pulleys, not the shitty gym that has dumbbells that only go up to 30 pounds. So there are a couple websites where you can search on this, or even when you're just booking your accommodation, just look and see, does it have a gym? Number one. Number two, look for photos of the gym, and you can just see, does the gym have the equipment that I need? Next favorite is Allbirds t-shirts. I'm actually wearing one right now. They have a great fit. They're 30% merino wool, which is really, really nice because I actually find that w shirts that are 100% merino wool, they don't have great durability. They fit really, really poorly. They wear out really, really quickly. They stretch and they don't hold their shape. And so these are a great mix of wool and other things. They went on sale in 2022. I have them linked in the playbook. And so I picked up about 12 for $30 each. So it was like a $350 purchase that like set me up for, I don't wear really anything else except for a couple other stragglers that like my wife got me t-shirt wise. And so if you've seen me wearing t-shirts on cooking content and some podcasts, almost all of those on Instagram, on TikTok, on uh, here on YouTube are from Allbirds. And so as shitty as Allbirds is performing as a company, good thing I don't have any of their stock. Their t-shirts are great. And I really, really like their t-shirts. I mentioned it a couple times, but the Outlive book by Peter Atia is, I would consider, required reading if you're under the age of 60. I have mentioned Peter's work in nearly every single playbook, and his advice has helped me immensely, especially because he talks about these four horsemen of death, so cancer, neurodegenerative disease, cardiovascular disease, and metabolic disease. My family, especially my parents, have three of four of them. So it's like, I need to know everything I can about these issues to make sure that I have the ability to navigate my health. And so I feel particularly drawn to his advice that can help my health span, the way he lays out ideas, the way he's like objective with being a little bit subjective. He's very cut and dry. And so that tends to really, really help me. Next one is just everything by Alex Hormozzi. I binged, and I'm not joking, every single piece of content that that man made in 2022. He has helped me immensely when talking about beliefs, thinking about business, decreasing my emotionality, upping my skills, thinking about even concepts that I'm not super well-versed in, like sales, philosophy, fitness. Alex has helped me a lot. And so big, big, big ups to Alex. I still love the All In podcast. I would argue it's gotten even better since I last recommended it. And so I'm recommending it again if you're not on the All In podcast hype train. Speaking of Alex Hormozzi, Dr. Kashi is another content creator. He's Alex's best friend. If you like Hormozzi, you would also enjoy Dr. Kashi. I don't think he gets enough love. A lot of wisdom, a lot of dry humor, but it's really, really good. Another podcast I've really in, been enjoying is the My First Million podcast. I mentioned it already. Some of my favorite episodes include, weirdly, the one with Martin Shkreli. You got to listen to it before you knock it. Uh, one with Nick Huber. This episode that I linked in the thing, Breaking Down Dave Ramsey's Empire, and so many more. Their dynamic is great. The topics they cover is great. For what they talk about and what my stage of life is right now, I feel like they're one of the few people who like... I can just jam with and hang out with on a weekly basis. And I just find myself increasingly just like cracking up at the jokes that they talk about. And I learn a lot and it saves me a bunch of time in my week versus like spending a bunch of time again, like doom scrolling or trying to sift through the news. I mentioned it already, but I'm going to say it again. Modern Wisdom podcast, Chris and his interviews, conversations. His second interview with Hormoz, Alex Hormozzi was really good. His interview he did with Goggins was really good. I took a bunch of notes from that and shared them in the Repertoire Pro community. He had a conversation with this guy off Twitter named Gerwinder Bogle, which is incredibly good on mental models and the just problems that ail us in this current modern age. And then he also had a really good conversation with Adam Lane Smith that I also linked up. And the, the, those deep dives are also really, really good. I think a couple more hacks here. One is finding a movie to work to. So Tim Ferriss talks about, I'm almost positive playing the movie Fight Club during his writing sessions as a productivity hack. He would just have it on in the background. And I wanted to just dig into that a little bit deeper because I found it incredibly productive for inbox management and just like boring admin tasks that you don't want to do. And so I can't recall whether or not Tim had the audio on, but for me... 
I used the extended edition of Lord of the Rings, the trilogy. It was a $20 purchase, and it's been hugely helpful for my productivity. And so what I do is I keep the audio on. I sit on the couch with my laptop. I know what's going to happen in the movie. And so I have almost all of the audio memorized. I can just play the movie in the background, and I don't get distracted by having to look up and like see what happens next. Like I know exactly what's going to happen. That's benefit number one. Number two, because I have the audio playing, it prevents me from browsing YouTube because I wouldn't be able to hear what's playing on my computer because the audio is on in the movie. And so I turn on the movie in our downstairs room TV when I need to respond to comments, when I need to schedule calendar stuff, when I need to go through my inbox, and I can just bust through it without additional distractions because I already have a quote-unquote distraction playing in the background that I already know that I like and I enjoy. Really, really good. The third thing, if you're going to try this, pick a movie that's long. And so these movies, again, remember, I got the extended editions. They're three to four hours each. And so they last, for me, an entire working session. I can put it on at 3 p.m. and I can work until 5.30. Get two and a half hours of inbox management done. Also, because there are three movies, I don't have to worry about, is it going to be Fight Club? Is it going to be Star Wars? Is it going to be The Godfather? I stay within the same world. And when Two Towers gets old, I put on The Fellowship. When Fellowship gets old, I put on Return of the King. And so I don't have any sort of fatigue on the movies because I can just, if I'm not feeling this one, I just switch to the other one. If I watch this one today, I pick a new one tomorrow. And for whatever reason, that magical number of three is really, really beneficial because even if I go from one to two, I can go from two to three. And then by, by the time I'm done with three, one is new again. That makes sense. And so if you want to try it, I'd highly, highly recommend it, especially for the type of person who just like you're inputting recipes, you're doing data entry, you're figuring out payroll, you're doing your taxes, like any categorizing your your credit card statements, any of this stuff for your business. It's been a fun hack that I've really, really enjoyed or and and um, I just that's the last hack that that completes the playbook in line with that one big habit change I'm making is keeping the playbook in my weekly review page on Notion. So I go through a weekly review process every week. And the reason behind that is, in years past, the only times that I would see these playbooks is when I was writing it and then, I, and then when I record this. And then it would sit on the shelf until I review it the next year. And so instead of that, I, I want to get in the habit of reviewing this more often. I think in me taking so much time to get this out into the world, it's been like I've been reviewing it a little bit more often, and it helps so much with sticking to your habits. Because if you write a playbook, and you told yourself you're going to do something, and you put it out publicly, when you go to read it, and you say, oh yeah, I did say I was going to stretch every single night. It's just like you telling yourself. It's not shaming from a negative public humiliation sense it's like yeah i said i was going to do that there's nothing holding me back from doing it and it's almost like this gentle reminder that you can give yourself over and over again to stick to what you said you were going to do so unlike previous editions i have a place to send you if you want to continue to read more of my writings i have a newsletter i write every week it's called the repertoire newsletter and if you enjoyed this contemplations on life, on philosophy, on learnings I take from other industries, and how it can apply to just us, people like us, you should definitely subscribe. It's linked in the description, and I would love for you to go check that out. I know that we're halfway through the year. I'm also not a big believer in being a January 1st-er. It's currently June 28th. You can start a new habit on June 28th doesn't have to be January 1st, doesn't even have to be July 1st. In fact, if you need to wait for a date to start something, you're probably not going to stick with it because you're going to have to go through, if you start on July 1st, you're going to have to go through July 28th. It's like, so you're going to have to do the thing on an odd number day anyways. So you might as well get used to doing it ASAP. So I know we're late, but regardless of how your year is going, I hope the second half of this year is as healthy, as safe, as creative, as fun, and as profitable as you hope it is. 
I really, really hope you folks have a good one. Thanks for spending the time with me. My name is Justin Kana. And I think I said I hope you have a good one. But I hope you have a good one. <laughs>